Uh, we're going to do a couple of quick introductions. And so uh, first we've got Dr. Craig uh, Browdy, who is the Chief Technical Officer at Cy Aqua. Cy Aqua is at the forefront of shrimp breeding, uh, employing tech, cutting edge technologies to provide best in class hatchery feed, genomic selection, quantitative genetics, and breeding science. Their uh, Vename breeding initiative uh, started in Berkeley uh, 22 years ago, uh, extended its research to diverse markets worldwide, including Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, and many more. And so uh, uh, Craig uh, has a couple slides, so we'll go ahead and run those real quickly, just a little more introduction for. Thank you. Um, yeah, just uh, I was asked to give a couple of slides of introduction about Cyaqua. Um, I joined Cyaqua actually only a couple of months ago. Uh, before that, at the last F3 meeting, I was up here saying I'm the Sheldon from Ziegler Brothers Incorporated, incorporating all the interesting things that everyone's brought to the table at this meeting and testing them in shrimp and putting them into our shrimp feeds. But now I've sort of turned and moved in a different direction and I'm, I'm can do a little bit more in the way of impact. I think I had a late life crisis, not enough stress in my life, so I decided to try something new and different. But SIAC was interesting because it's really where technology meets sustainability, and that's the part that was just so exciting to me when they, I got recruited. It, like we said, it's been around for 22 years. It's gone through a lot of different um, um, genetic nucleuses and a lot of breeding, but led by Thomas Gitterly over uh, the past 72 generations, we've been focusing on a specific genetic uh, a goal, which is to uh, develop more or less a, uh, a, a, a balanced uh, genetic line that, um, that, 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 that balances growth and survivability, giving a shrimp that, that really performs well in a, in, in a, in a broad range of environments. And um, so here you can see that uh, Cyaqua was, was bought uh, a few years ago by Oceans 14 Capital. Oceans 14 is named for um, UN Sustainable Goal 14 and focuses on leading the blue growth of the blue economy. And I think Cyaqua is probably one of the leading first investments in the, in the, in the area of aquaculture. So, so being led by this kind of group and with their support, we're really moving towards changing the shrimp growth farming as we know it, particularly in Asia. And so it's it was kind of an exciting, exciting goal to, to take over. So we're, we're really in a unique position to address both um, genetics and nutrition with our early nutrition um, feeds and our, and our, and our expanding um, genetics program. We really want to um, enable the environmental sustainability and at the same time profitability. It's kind of like the, the, the idea is that if you can get something that's more profitable to a farmer and at the same time better for the environment, then it's sort of like a ball rolling downhill. And one of the ways we do that is by trying to improve feed conversion ratios. Because if you improve um, conversion of feeds, if you're allowed, if you can develop a strain of shrimp that genetically uh, converts better, then you can actually uh, save the farmer money. You can use cheaper feeds because they're able to convert them better. And at the same time, release less nitrogen and carbon into the environment and really improve the sustainability of shrimp farming as we know it. So that's the, the path we're on and the direction we're trying to go to. And one of the ways that we, one of the things we need in order to get there that I think we'll talk about a little bit on the panel is big data, is the ability to get the farmers to raise the game. You give them a better shrimp, you can give them a better feed, but if they overfeed, it doesn't help you. So you have to get the management piece in there too. So these are the kinds of things that we're working on today. And then um, we also have sort of a division for tomorrow. With all of these problems that in the background, we look for solutions. We look for ways that we can move the ball forward. We look for ways that we can solve these problems and in so doing, um, become relevant to the industry. So I thought I'd throw this up here. This is a paper that I and about seven colleagues published in uh, 2006, where we ran a pond of shrimp with a completely veg organic shrimp, uh, fish meal free diet, fish meal and fish oil free diet. Back then, and I think this was done in like 2003, we had gotten the um, oil from a company called ABN from algae, and we sort of mixed it together with a bunch of plant-based feeds. 
And this was sort of the conclusion that we reached. At uh, low density in outdoor ponds, we were able to raise shrimp um, to, to a harvest size of 19 grams, uh, 93, 88% survival with very nice feed conversion ratio of 1.3 in a diet that was completely free of fish meal and fish oil. And uh, now here we are in uh, 2024, and this is a quote from one of my, my, the best mentors I've ever had, Dr. Tom Ziegler. The impossible just takes a little longer. So let's just keep on pushing. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Uh, so our next panelist here, uh, Dr. Locke Tron, founder and CEO of Shrimp Vet Lab uh, and Eco Seafood Group and uh, Min Fu Aqua Mekong. He's also an assistant professor at Nong Lam University in Ho Chi Minh City. And the Shrimp Vet Lab includes a state-of-the-art shrimp disease diagnostics lab, a vertically integrated operation with a commercial hatchery, nursery, and algae lab, and a demonstration grow-out farm uh, near Ho Chi Minh City in Vung Tau. Uh, shrimp Vet also conducts feed trials to determine the impact of feed ingredients on disease resistance. Committing to sustainability, Shrimp Vet produces high quality SPF shrimp PLs and actively pursues net zero discharge commercial production. And so Locke's also got a couple slides to share some of this work. So Locke, please. Thank you for the introduction, sir. And uh, today I'm gonna present something uh, that I want to pursue in order to move the stream industry uh, in Vietnam forward to more sustainability and uh, predictability. And uh, uh, in the last few days, we talked about uh, F3 feet, but what about F3 shrimp? I wanted to make it real. So let's start with our journey starting from uh, 10 years ago. We started with a small, humble laboratory uh, in Ho Chi Minh City providing diagnostic services and research services to the industry. And then we start with many satellite uh, laboratories across Vietnam to help farmers. And we build a hand tree, first ever, doing non-ablation and antibiotic free with one billion PL production capacity. And then we build a demonstration farm over there. We were the first to try the F3 uh, feed in Vietnam at commercial scale. And we build a research center for mariculture. And uh, in 2024, we have a spin-off named Eco Seafood Group to uh, be able to produce F3 shrimp. So we have footprint across Vietnam with diagnostic laboratory, hatchery, shrimp farms, and, and so on. With now with more than 100 employees from all over the world. So let's talk a bit about the businesses of the shrimp in Vietnam. So Vietnam is among the leading uh, producers in the world, but uh, we're facing serious problems with regards to low efficiency, high cost, and sustainability, especially uh, pollution. So we got uh, disease outbreak, environmental concern, global market competition. You see, in the past few years, Vietnam could not compete with other uh, suppliers like uh, Ecuador and India. And the reason is that uh, the farming is operated by small household farmers with very weak supply chain. And we want to fundamentally change the business model of uh, the industry. So I want to show you a quick look uh, of all the diseases we may, find, we may find in Asia. And every one or two years, our laboratory uh, figure out a new one. It's all the nasty disease. And uh, we are very uh, focused on uh, creating um, a comprehensive program to fundamentally reduce the risk of every diseases in farming. And, and our ambition in farming is to scale up sustainable seafood. And we found we have a spin-off company named Eco Seafood Group because the abbreviation is ESG, and we want to make it an ESG company. So the ambition is to uh, raise the standard for uh, the farm seafood with uh, better animal welfare, like ablation-free, stress-free, antibiotic-free, high standard for food safety, completely transparent and traceability. And we aim to have first ever net zero stream farming in the world. And also affluent-free in uh, water discharge, 
and focus on uh, social responsibility. We have no damage to uh, how local household, uh, open source education for farmers nearby, and create a platform for small household uh, farmers to participate. We don't want to leave them behind. In terms of governance, we create SOB, open source education, AI driven for our farm. And we want to produce F3 certified uh, seafood at scale. So uh, uh, the secret is that we have been investing a lot in research. And this is our first research modules with hundreds of ponds for us to optimize the operation and reduce the risk of uh, disease outbreak, et cetera. So we gain a lot of know-how. Every crop, we gain maybe 10% of efficiency. And with the compounding effects in the past 10 years, we could really fundamentally reduce the risk and production costs. And now we want to put it in scale. So the idea is that StreamVet will be like uh, the foundation for, uh, for the expansion of this business because it provide the know-how in diagnostic, disease control, genetic, nutrition, et cetera. It's just like we build the basement, the foundation for the house. And when we move to uh, designing, operating a farm, it's just like we, uh, we build a house. And uh, we also integrate with AI technology for smart farm, risk control, et cetera. So it's like decoration of the house. And we also have a lot of in-house innovation and we can put into scale to scale that up. For example, we developed some uh, proprietary in-house innovation in AMP production antimicrobial uh, peptide from black soda fly, and we know exactly how to trigger that production at scale. And we also can produce uh, beneficial bacteria at scale for application at vast scale. So this is the idea of how to design a carbon neutral farm. So we have about 50% of the area for the farming, and another like 40 to 50% of the area for waste capture. So the waste generated from the farming will be captured by various species, including tilapia, field feeders, uh, bivalves, salicornia, and eventually uh, uh, mangroves. That is the idea. And this is the reality. So we could buy a piece of land and build that model. And you see the, the blue uh, uh, light in the, in the right is the area for mangroves to capture the waste. And this is what happened. So we started a project about six months ago with a bit of capital from my wife. And we could build a farm. <laughs> <laughs> and it looks exactly like uh, what we were designing. And uh, you know, all the wind turbines just made up. But eventually, we put some wind turbine to power the farm. And we just recently got a grant from the Dutch government for 100,000 euros uh, for us to do all the documentation showing that we can achieve uh, net zero eventually. So, and this is a little video. So this is the aerial view of the farm. So the farm is like a shrimp factory because we can produce nonstop five crops a year continuously. And the farm can produce about 2,000 metric tons of shrimp. And let's put into perspective, this will be able to satisfy 10% of the seafood demand for Singapore. So we just need to have like 10 more modules to be able to secure the seafood security for Singapore. And this is like a standard module for us to scale up. And we were going to put an, another 15 module like this in three years. So uh, I first proposed this idea to some uh, um, uh, investor that we need a few million dollars to put uh, this in place. And you know the, the idea was so too crazy. And eventually, I asked my wife for approval to go ahead and do it first. So we complete the first phase already. And in the next few years, we want to expand. Uh, for this module, another maybe 15 more modules. And also, we will uh, help farmers to create another uh, 70,000 metric tons of shrimp. So that means potentially we can produce 100,000 metric tons of F3 shrimp in Vietnam in the course of five, six years. And we run the business module and showing that the payback time for our project is 18 months only. So theoretically, we can double our production every year. 
So some further thoughts that we can achieve many goals, in, including sustainability, food safety, business opportunity, higher economics return, etc., at once. Uh, and for the market, we now have a problem in the stream industry, especially with the low market demand. And we have more consumer-centric approach in making uh, farm, uh, seafood more affordable and reliable. And uh, we can improve food security and we consistent supply and quality. And the F3 stream will be available. I hope that next meeting, we'll have the F3 stream served at our dinner. So with that, I would like to thank you guys for your attention. Thank you. And, and real quickly, uh, my boss, the dean of the Ag College, uh, told me to remember that Locke has been recognized as one of our distinguished alumni from the University of Arizona. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Our third panelist, uh, Kristen uh, Variga, is the senior leader of strategic feed initiatives at eFishery which is now the largest distributor of feed in Indonesia, serving over 70,000 fish and shrimp farmers in Indonesia, as well as B2B marketplace to sell feed to farmers and fish and shrimp back to B2B businesses. eFishery last year hit unicorn status uh, as they're valued at uh, over a billion dollars. Uh, they leverage cutting edge sensor technology to provide fisheries products as the primary source of animal protein delivering not only nutrition, but also accessibility to people around the globe. Uh, Kristen currently leads the global shrimp and tilapia value chain, where he oversees group feed strategy and rollout across the largest feed distribution in Indonesia. So can you tell us a little bit more about eFishery, please? Yeah, first of all, hi everyone, thanks for having me. Um, thanks for inviting me to the panel. Um, so eFishery is sort of this, it, it's weird, we're, we're not a farmer and we're not a feed company either. We're actually a data company. And um, we built the, uh, the largest network um, in Indonesia, uh, so your numbers are slightly outdated. We have about 300,000 farms um, in our network across Indonesia where we've been able to put in sensors, collect data over years and years and years. So we have a fairly good, robust data set. Um, and we've been able to combine that now with uh, external data, um, weather data, et cetera, et cetera, to, to uh, roll out a really powerful predictive analytics engine. So we can predict disease within 96% accuracy five days before it happens. And that allows you to make a meaningful difference in SOP. Um, you can significantly increase survivability rates, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we're just rolling out now. Um, the latest tool is uh, an AI tool. It's sort of like chat GPT for farmers. Right? So it's a, it's a very specific uh, AI tool. Actually, the CEO, CEO of Microsoft was down in Indonesia, uh, I think 10 days ago or so. And, it was one of, the, uh, one of the things he called out in his keynote um, in terms of the, the AI. So, you know, it's, it's very much around how uh, we've used the data to create more productivity out of the same level of input, okay? Which is, that's nice, that's the first step, yeah? But our challenge to ourselves is, well, how the hell do we get more input out of, uh, how, more output out of less input? And I think that's where, you know, today's conversation becomes pretty interesting, yeah? Um, we currently, we move around 250,000 tonnes of feed. So as we, as we started up, we had the data. But actually what we're doing now is we're becoming a, an ecosystem binder in Indonesia to create co-ops around smallholder farmers. And the difference with e-fisheries, we don't go after the big guys. You know, they're, they're the key accounts and things like that. And of course, they're interested. But actually where we, tr we truly try to make an impact is around the smallholder farmer and gluing the smallholder farmer together into a more powerful co-op that then we can leverage our data to deliver productivity, we can deliver the volume to deliver cost savings, and we have a number of risk mitigation tools, things like disease predictors, uh, financing tools, et cetera, et cetera. And we put that together into a powerful package, yeah. And what that allows us to do is it allows us to, uh, to get a significantly better trial model on new, um, particularly new feeds and things like this, PL, 
um, because we we provide an ecosystem benefit and then say if you want that ecosystem benefit then you need to use this feed or you need to use this PL yeah and so what we're what we're doing now is we're in this uh, um, this the second phase is about how do we get more productivity with with less input so you know, feed plays a key role, and, and we call this our, our transformation um, um, strategy. Yeah, and feed is obviously one of the key levers there. And how do we, you know, right now we distribute other people's feed, and marketplace happens, uh, Peruvian anchovy happens, and we're not in control of our own formulation. You know, we're just distributing other people's feed. So now we're moving into how we control that. You know, how do we land our own e-fishery feed yeah but we also have community reinvestment programs where we've got mangrove reforestation programs to take out a hundred thousand metric tons of carbon the feed plays a key role that takes out another seventy five thousand tons uh, per year you know in, in our calculation so it's it's a vital and key role um, in how we're going to deliver impact we also partner with the likes of BAP and ASC to deliver farm certification standards so that smallholder farmers were raising the bar on the, the farming methods that they use so that they can become more certified. Um, and then we have a byproducts uh, work stream, which is about taking all the shimp shells and heads and things like this and creating bioplastics and circularity into packaging, et cetera, et cetera. But where feed becomes really interesting mm -hmm. is you know, as we move into, into our own formulation or an exclusive formulation, I think there's a huge opportunity. Not only the opportunity that you've laid out, which is how do you get out of krill, yeah? But shrimp diets are over-formulated. There's too much protein in them. Actually, there's more than the animal needs. So it's not only about how you take marine protein out, but I think the real challenge is how do you take total protein levels down? Reduce organic loads in ponds, reduce disease, improve uh, wastewater treatment costs, reduce energy consumption, all of these become really interesting uh, benefits in, the, in what we're chasing down. Yeah. yeah, I think that's all a good point. And so following up on that, um, so what do you see uh, in recent years, the advancements of uh, reducing fish meal, fish oil in uh, shrimp feeds in particular? And Craig, your experience both with Ziegler and, and Cy Aqua, what would you say has been going and what, where are we going with it now? I think uh, the, the point you made uh, about shrimp feeds being over-formulated, I think uh, particularly in Asia, I think Ecuador is starting to, uh, to, to be a little bit less over-formulated than, than some other places with the price pressures that they're <laughs> under. But uh, certainly, uh, you know, shrimp farming in Asia started with um, Pinaeus monodon, which is a much more carnivorous species and it's always had higher protein levels. And taking advantage of the Vaname strains that are, that are being cultured today, and particularly some of the genetic uh, lines that are being developed, um, we're able to significantly reduce, I think, that, that protein need and, and to more efficiently convert the protein. And to me, um, if we're talking about really making a difference globally, one thing is reducing the fish meal, but the other, and perhaps as important or more important, is, um, is reducing the feed conversion ratios and, like you say, be more efficient in terms of how you produce. So that way, a lot less waste goes into the environment that has to then be uh, recycled through mangroves and other things like that. And um, that's, that to me is, a, is truly an exciting opportunity. And, and I thought it was interesting that yesterday before lunch, um, one of the things we were challenged with was um, trying to avoid the law of unintended consequences. And I think it's something we really need to take to heart in a, in a, in a meeting like this. Because you know, if you can remove 100% of the fish meal from the feed, the second question, well, I've showed that we could do that back in 2006. But the question we really need to ask ourselves in a, in a sort of a larger scale, similar to what you guys are doing, is should we? And if we should, how much should we remove? And should we really extend fish meal as opposed to replacing fish meal? If we can get more efficiency and actually have a better better effect on uh, what's going on in the ponds and the health of the animals and what goes out into the environment. And so, Locke, in Vietnam, uh, obviously a huge producer, where do you see it going here in the future uh, and how has it changed in the last few years on fish meal, fish oil, percentage and diets? 
So uh, about 10 years ago when I first returned to Vietnam, at that time stream farming was like gambling. So people don't care about their production costs, they just need to produce and be able to produce and make money. And now with the competition globally, we have to think about efficiency. So the feed cost is also one of the key factors, but also how we run the farm, how we design the farm, how we optimize the stocking density and so on to uh, put everything together to increase the efficiency in general. So farmers start to understand that and now we need to work our best you know, to reduce the production cost, including, including improving the feed uh, conversion and uh, protein efficiency. Okay. And, and Christian, over in uh, Indonesia, and I know you're growing pretty quickly in India as well, uh, with the situation with Peruvian anchovy last year, uh, did you see much impact in that, in uh, selection of, of proteins and looking at alternatives? Uh, yeah, but we weren't in control of it. You know, we're, we're distributing other people's feeds, yeah? And actually that, that sparked the need to say, how do we get control here? I mean, what it, it led to was a very um, disparate implementation of SOP and farming, different farming results. Um, and then we couldn't predict biomass as well. So um, obviously each feed company reacts, you know, in their own way. I used to work at Growbest, so I know exactly the dark arts of what happens behind the door in, in, in a feed company. And, uh, and, you know, so I can imagine what, what they were all doing um, to, to preserve their own cost. But that led to a very uh, sporadic uh, um, uh, SOP and, and, and the, the output. So part of it is about putting, you know, control in place so that when we go to customers, you know, at the end of the day, you need to have a you need to have an output for, for, for this. You know, it's not just about having interesting feed, it's about having interesting feed that leads to a, a very well-produced animal that then can be commercialized to, to, you know, to a retailer. Yeah? Now, when people start moving around their selection of, of fish meal because of the Peruvian anchovy season, it puts at risk uh, the certification standards that you're saying the product has. How can you be really sure um, so, you know, one of the things we've done is we've built our own traceability tool to, to be able to do that and we, we ask our, our feed suppliers to, to plug into that to be able to get back to feed and feed ingredients in our traceability tool. But, um, but we need to take that control back, which is why we're moving into our own uh, exclusive formulation. And, and so do you see much difference uh, as you're getting more into India compared to what's going on in Indonesia in that respect? Um, they're fairly similar models, actually. I think there's more similarities than, than differences. I mean, of course, there's, in, in India, we're primarily, we're only commercializing fish. We haven't commercialized shrimp, and that's primarily because there's a number of enablers that we don't have in place that we need to get in place. So um, that work's going on in the background, but it's, so in, in India, it's, it's primarily a fish business, but you know, we're, we're talking about shrimp here, but the, the same principles um, translate across fish and shrimp. and what we found is our model is really scalable. You know, if you go and talk to a farmer and say, listen, if you want, I can give you more productivity, I'll give you less cost, and I'll reduce your risk. That, that's pretty universal, actually. You know, that's a universal value proposition. You can go anywhere with that. It, te it tends to resonate with smallholder farmers, which is why we've chosen India first. Yeah? But that model is become, becomes very plug and play, and you, know, you can see uh, as we, we have an ambition to create the world's most impact, impactful aquaculture company. And that requires scale. Yeah? And obviously we won't be able to do that if we're only in Indonesia. So, yeah. So, so Craig and Locke, I know you're both real involved with the breeding side, hatchery, larval feeds. Where do you see the need for alternative ingredients uh, in, in those kind of specialty diets uh, where oftentimes we're looking for higher protein or higher fat content? Uh, Craig, why don't you go first? Yeah, just um, if I could tag on to the end of the last question about uh, what was going on with the uh, shutdown of the anchovita fishery. Uh, one of the big success stories I see of F3 is really fish oil as opposed to fish meal, and it was the fish oil prices that just went through the roof. And the beauty is that um, in the last meeting, we saw all of the different alternatives that are, that are becoming reality these days. There's enough alternative DHA produced in the world right now to replace every single drug 
drop of fish oil that's used in aquaculture globally. And so when the price started going up, the shift to those kinds of ingredients that are already available in the marketplace um, was, was relatively seamless. And of course, the use of, um, of, of byproducts and, stu and, and so forth. So, so nowadays, you've sort of, in, in the I guess you call it the dark arts in that back room, but sometimes it can be a bright art also, that you can put these things together and that these alternatives are out there. And so you have the tools. What, what this group and what this meeting and what these things are creating is more tools and more options that the feed companies can use when there's a situation like we had last year. Um, larval feeds is, is, is really a fun place to play. I called myself last time at this meeting at Sheldon, and I picked some of these really cool things that are coming out, you know, because like you said, you know, there's, there's actually properties of some of these alternative ingredients, particularly fermented ingredients in shrimp, that really have a benefit on the, uh, the animal's uh, immune system and the animal's ability to be resilient and strong. And that's really important in larval feeds, and in larval feeds you can afford to, and because the volumes are small, you're able to take some of these new novel ingredients that aren't really produced even at scale yet and show that they're able to be used and that helps the uh, company that's developing these ingredients to show that they, they actually have a, a, a uh, commercial application even in a small scale. So larval feeds are a very interesting laboratory to play with. Yeah. Yeah. Locke? Yeah. And, uh, just keep that. Uh, yeah. So from Srivet, we have been testing for many novel ingredients, and we found a lot of interesting, cool stuff, uh, especially with regards to the immune system of the shrimp. And I feel like when we have more and more ingredients, it's like we have more and more ingredients in our kitchen for us to formulate different meals. And we have more options in, in case of, uh, let's say, supply chain disruption, et cetera. So that will bring us more security for the feed business. And at the same time, we can optimize and uh, combine different uh, ingredients together, in, especially with regards to some fermented ingredients, to improve the shrimp health in general. And through the feed, we can really increase the resilience for the shrimp. And uh, we have less problem with diseases. So I mean, at, at eFishery, we've we've now we're in test with our formula. We've got a uh, it's approaching zero fish meal. It's not quite zero fish meal, but we lean heavily into precision fermentation on um, well, on certain ingredients. Um, and what we've been able to show right now is we can get to we have a, a prototype formula at zero, but we haven't uh, commercialized it yet. That's in test, and we can get three percent better FCR with actually 10% less protein, total protein level, and zero fish meal um, with uh, seaweed fermentations and soybean fermentations, things like this. So those, um, that's very much where, where we're leaning to. And you know, the, the benefit that we have there on the farming side is one, you get productivity, 3% better FCR. But the, the cost side is the cost to replace is lower, actually. So we're able to, to deliver a, a, a fairly attractive cost signature to the product as well. Yeah. So another <clears throat> expensive thing that we use in, in hatcheries are polychaetes and squid and clams. Um, do you see some of these alternative ingredients uh, filling in the gap? Because we're trying to use less and less of that for biosecurity and, and all these issues. Uh, are some of these alternatives, kind of like what you were saying, Lo uh, Craig and Locke both, of these are good places to uh, bring some of these new ingredients into the mix if we can replace some of those uh, uh, broodstock supplemental feeds. Yeah, for me, when I was um, uh, developing the, uh, the broodstock feeds that, that Ziegler currently has on the market and that I think are, are really market leading feeds. I was focusing in on a lot of the things that were discussed yesterday in terms of attractability. If you can't get them to eat the broodstock feed, then they're not going to be able to get the goodies that you need into the female so that they can do the incredible things they do in terms of producing 40% of their biomass in eggs every three or four days. And But they have to be able to eat it. And you have to get them to eat it in preference to things like, like fresh squid, which they really love. And so, uh, you know, all all of these uh, things that we were talking about yesterday in attractants is a perfect example of um, you know how we're making those feeds better. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I know Locke, you're you're testing a lot of these things there in, in your lab, so it's it's great to 
know that's happening. Yeah, and agree that uh, Bruce stock feed is the one of the main source of uh, infection for the entire chain. So we need to do something about it. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, so, um, what do you see as as major challenges uh, and opportunities uh, for uh, these alternative ingredients as as we continue going forward, Kristen? There's no shortage of cool ingredients, actually. We've seen heaps here. There's, there's many more. Actually, the people we're working with are not in the room, so there's, there's many around. Um, and you have to form your coalition of the willing, right? And, you know, that's what, we're, what I've found here is um, you can't change the world by yourself. Or you, you can, but it takes, you get exhausted, and it takes a long time. Um, so you've really got to get your coalition of the willing, the people who believe in the same dream. And that needs to go all the way through to the retailer because it's, you know, you can go and create whatever you want from, uh, you know, let's say, Lock, you've got a great program to get to carbon, you know, neutral, fantastic, right? But if there's no outcome, if there's no retailer that wants that or there's no one who wants to pay for that, yeah. then we're doing a lot of work for not a lot of benefit because at the end of the day what do we want to do and i think everyone's here because we want to create impact right impact in real terms is about getting more aquaculture products consumed on world markets yeah and yes with lower in, in impact signatures and and you know better carbon signatures etc cetera, etc cetera, but you have to have that coalition of the willing you know people who can pull together and provide the right level of testing get the data together you know whether you do it at Shrimp Vet or, you know, you come to eFishery, I've got a 300,000 ponds that I can throw things in. I can't throw them in each pond, but let's say I've got a fairly wide network of actual farm ponds that we can test in. You know, and then we at, at eFishery, we've been very, very intentional about bringing in retailers into that conversation early as well to make sure that when we pull this together, actually there is a, there's an output for it you know, and, and, and a need for it. So I think that's the number one challenge. The number two is how do we right size the, the, the formulation? You know, everything is over formulated. So the challenge is not just the removal of the marine, it's what I was referring to earlier. It's like, well, how do you reduce overall protein um, to reduce water, tr uh, treatment costs, organic loads in ponds, disease, et cetera, et cetera. And I think overall that leads to better productivity, better cost signatures for yeah. everyone. Okay, Craig, what would you add to that? Boy, that was really well said. Thank you. I think that uh, creating coalitions of the willing, I got to remember that term. It's a great, great idea. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm just starting in, um, in, in Sayakwa, and I think there's great opportunities to partner. And, and I say to, you know, the feed companies out there and the big data companies and so forth, and, you know, we're willing to try to help produce the seed, and we're willing to help try and, and, and do our part. Let's come together, and let's show examples, really good examples, like the one that Locke is building um, so that we can then bring the rest of the world with us. I think you said it really, really well. Um, but the key is not only the retailers, I would take it to the consumer. That's why I'm so excited about this TV show. I hope it comes out really <laughs> nice because we got to reach everybody. We got to talk yeah. to the consumers. And that's, that's the part that sometimes we forget. There has to be a pull. We can push as hard as we can and as hard as we want. But until there's a pull, it makes it very, very difficult. And I think we'll get there. So, luck? <laughs> okay, very interesting, I want to add on. So first of all, I think we need to be realistic before we talk about sustainability. And that is why Srimbet has been uh, doing a lot of uh, testing, research, optimization in order to bring down the cost. So we have room for some sustainability stuff. And it's been a very challenging path for us to do like non-ablation, antibiotic free, and now we talk about net zero. And you know, creating a circular economy does not increase the cost in general, but in fact, it will increase the revenue from uh, some other products like uh, uh, fish and bivalves and so on and, and so on. So eventually it helps us to bring down the cost, not increasing the cost. And, and I think the second issue we need to solve is to how to raise the public awareness. And I think the aquaculture uh, people must uh, step up and take some risk. And producing uh, better product, but 
like StreamWeb, we don't necessarily sell stream at premium price for the time being because we have some room for, uh, for those sustainability stuff so we can help the retailer to create good stories how we produce stream and we offer better choices for the consumer so they can pick the stream that can help save the world. Thank you. And thank you all panelists. Uh, round of applause for our panelists and uh, much appreciated.